Amen. All right. Well, hey, how many guys have know so far that our society kind of uh, kind of has a bad attitude towards the Bible? All right, just a little bit there. Okay. In fact, if you've noticed, uh, and we've talked about this before, uh, society not only has a bad attitude on the Bible, but it's getting so perverse that they're coming up with new versions of the Bible to suit their needs. Okay. Let me give you just a recap of a couple of those. We've seen before the politically correct version that's actually out there. Uh, and let me give you one example where it says uh, Jesus, of course, the Bible says being God's only son. Now, this version has changed it to, quote, no one knows the child except the father, mother, and no one knows the father, mother, except the child. So you've got to be politically correct in case you don't have a, you know. Okay, but that's one version. And it's really out there. I'm not making it up. It's how perverse it's getting. Uh, another egregious one that's out there is the new feminist version. I think this is from the LBI Institute, if you want to check it out yourself. And uh, listen to how they've changed the feminist version, Matthew 28. It now states, quote, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. But the angel said to the woman, uh, uh, the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Judith, J-U-D-I-T-H, who was crucified. She is not here. She is risen. Makes you want to wash your tongue just saying it. Okay, you guys just had to listen to it. Wash your ears when you get home. Okay, and now it's getting so bad that they've now come out with the gay Bible. Okay, I don't know if you guys have seen this, okay. Where Adam gets the heave-ho, he's now replaced with Ida, A-I-D-A, so that, quote, this is the Genesis account rewritten. A woman shall leave her mother and shall cleave unto her wife, and they shall be one flesh, okay, with another woman, okay, Ida. And Eve is the new story. And in this version, they, of course, they say that Jesus was gay and that gay is right and being straight is a sin, okay, these are actual versions that are out there today. It's getting worse and worse. Now, I set you up because, believe it or not, it's getting even worse than that, okay? Those are horrible. Those are perverse. Uh, but right now, thanks to evolution, uh, they now have an account out there saying that Jesus was born not of a virgin. Jesus was born of a gorilla. Totally blasphemous, okay? But if you think about it, the live evolution, this is the premise. Let's take a look at it. Imagine. From the loins of beautiful primates came prophets such as Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, the Buddha, and Lao Tzu. When we look at our evolutionary cousins, we look at ourselves in a beautifully preserved time capsule. That we evolved from apes, or that the universe is billions of years old, only deepens the mystery. Our rational way of life has left us starving for the spiritual starving for a special connection to the cosmos, a connection that the mothers of Moses and the fathers of Jesus still seem to cherish. How did our common ancestors give birth to the mystical sense within us? How did they learn to compose poetry, or speak in metaphors, or capture the sublime on a painted canvas? Look deep into their eyes. That the father of Jesus was not somewhere in heaven, but in the sperm of beautiful primates closely related to these, is one of the most liberating and joyful discoveries in human history. Actually, it's one of the most blasphemous statements uh, in human history. I'll just say this as a side note. Uh, how about doing something like that to the Quran? What would happen? But you're going to put out a promotional video saying that Jesus came from a gorilla. Okay, but if you think about it, folks, that's the logical teaching and conclusion of evolution, right? That would therefore even include Jesus, okay? And you'll wonder why I'm preaching on this stuff. And that's exactly why, Tom, we are going to continue our study. That's right. The witness of creation. You guys know the theme, hopefully. We're taking a look at different evidences that God's left behind for us, showing us that he's not just real, but the good news is we can have a relationship with him, personal, intimate one, through Jesus. Anybody excited about that? Yes, praise God, okay? That's what it's really all about. It's not just for intellectual titillation. It's to show you, hey, he's real. Join into a relationship with him through Jesus. Now, he's done that in many different ways. We saw that first evidence was the evidence of an intelligent creation. Ten studies on intelligent design from the telescope to the microscope. We saw the second evidence was the evidence of a young creation, that we have not been here for millions and billions of years, okay? Uh, it's only been a few thousand years, like the Bible says, okay? And then we saw it last time, the third evidence was the evidence of a special creation, okay? And this is good news, folks, because the Bible says that we were specially created for a special purpose, to have a special relationship with a special God. That's a great message. That's worth getting out of bed for, 
Okay, now contrast that to evolution that says, hey, you are nothing, you came from nothing, and you came from nowhere, and when you die, there's no purpose for life. I don't know about you, but that's not very motivating. Okay, <laughs> and so of course it's a lie. They say we came from a simple cell to a, a blob of gel to an ape that smells, okay, is what they teach, okay? And uh, so we took a look at it. We didn't just say, okay, that's what the Bible says, so I ignore the facts. Okay, let's take a look at your so-called facts. We took a look at that supposed ape-man evolution. You guys remember that? And uh, we saw that every single one, Nebraska man, Piltdown man, Neanderthal man, Java man, Peking man, etc., 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 every single one, folks, not just uh, uh, three out of four, not just half of them. Oh, by the way, did you guys know that five out of four people have trouble with fractions? I digress. Uh, but every single one of them is a lie, a hoax, or has nothing to do uh, with man and animal coming. It's just a bunch of baloney, okay? As we saw, man, gee whiz, if that's all you got for your evidence, maybe it's time to get a new theory, okay? Is the, the conclusion, okay? But you might be thinking, well, okay, so maybe this eight man uh, to eight to man evolution thing is a bunch of baloney and it's bankrupt. Uh, but what about animal evolution, okay? Because they, they say that's uh, for sure, we got evidence for that. And if you guys paid attention and remember back in those school days, or if you visited some museums, you're actually going to see on display some of their so-called proof. And that's with the horse evolution. You ever see that? Or the whale evolution, okay? And they said, this is proof positive. We've got it right here in this glass case. We know this is how whales and horses evolved over millions and millions. Have you ever seen that? Well, okay, so uh, before we get into that, let's remind ourselves, though, let's deal with the evidence, both sides, and uh, let's uh, look at God's side first. Let's take a look at where the animals came from, uh, including the horse and the whale. Uh, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, and uh, let's take a look, according to the Bible anyway, where in the world did the animals come from? Okay, Genesis chapter 2, and if you find uh, Genesis chapter 1, what do you do? Go to chapter 2, hang your right, do something like that. You guys are on the ball. Verse 19, let's take a look. Where did the animals come from? Did it take millions and millions of years for them to evolve? Okay, I don't think so, but let's take a look. Here it is, uh, Genesis chapter 2, starting with verse 19. says this, Now the Lord God, who did it? The Lord God had formed out of the ground how many of the beasts? All, every single one of them, all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. Okay? He brought them to the man, of course, Adam, to see what he would name them. And whatever the man uh, called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Probably had him watch TV or something, Tom, late at night or one of my sermons or something. But anyway, well, I digress. Uh, deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and he closed up the place with fr uh, flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called. This is exactly what Robert Rodriguez is going to do, Lord willing, in about two weeks. When he sees Carly come down the aisle, she's going to be called, Whoa, man. Okay, it's going to be the same. Hey, thank you, Jordan. You like that one. Take that back to Canada. Uh, for he was taken. She was taken out of man. Okay, obviously Adam is pretty excited. Okay. But uh, the Bible clearly says, folks, uh, that God is the one who not only made all the animals, how many of them? All, it says right there, and man. And according to the context, he did it all in one day, on day six, not millions and millions of years. But if you think about it, you got some other specifics going on there. It says there that God specifically brought all the animals there to Adam to what? To name them. Now stop and think about this. Ladies, I know that uh, we men sometimes can take a little while to finish our projects, right? Ooh, and that nervous laughter told the facts, okay. Uh, but how many guys would say it probably didn't take Adam millions and billions of years uh, to name all these animals? Okay, and uh, not only that, flip it around. Do you think it really took God millions and billions of years to bring the animals to Adam? I mean, was he really getting frustrated? God, it's been one million years since you brought the last animal, the giraffe, okay? That's all I've been thinking about. Could you bring something new? How about a turtle? How about a son? Okay, so obviously it didn't take millions and billions of years, okay? But this is the obvious problem. What does evolution teach? They say exactly the opposite once again, that it took millions and millions of years for animals to evolve, okay? Therefore, let's take a look at the supposed animal evolution. Last time it was eight-man evolution. Let's take a look at animals now and see who's telling the truth, okay? Now, we've already read, in all fairness, the biblical account. 
So let's take a look. Let's immerse ourselves, remind ourselves of evolution's account, okay, starting with the horse, okay? We're going to take a look at the horse evolution and uh, where they say that the horse came from, okay? Now, I'm not making this up. This is a typical textbook uh, response of where horses came from, okay? They say over a period of millions of years. Now, really? Were you there? Did you get a printout? What, how do you... Anyway, a millions of years, the horse grew from a small fox-like animal that was only two feet tall uh, to the modern-day horse, which stands more than six feet high. Wow. And he says, here's how it happened. Along the way, it lost its toes. Now, how many of you guys hate it when that happens? You're just walking along, next thing you know, your toes fall off, and it's just, this evolution stuff's dangerous, folks. Pay attention. All right. Uh, therefore, the horse, they says, because his toes fell off, okay, uh, it doesn't look like it always does today, okay, back then. Uh, in fact, they said it took 60 million years for the horse to develop into what we have today. The first horse was called Eohippus, which means dawn horse. Uh, it was a small forest animal, as you can see there, and looked nothing at all like a horse. It had a doggish look and an arched back, a short neck, short snout, short legs, and long tail. It's kind of like my family heritage. You know, it was a dry year when they plucked me except for the tail. We kind of skipped that evolution. Uh, in fact, they say it probably scampered from thicket to thicket like a modern deer, only stupider, slower, and not as agile. Okay, that's not for my family, or at least I'm not going to own up to that. Uh, let's move on. Uh, and that's right, Lucy, here's a surprise. Uh, the tiger's teeth are mainly pointed, and it only eats meat. Well, guess what, Ron? That's right, this first horse also had pointed teeth. So what does that tell us about this first horse? Rawr! That's right. According to evolution, this first horse was a carnivore. And my theory was, don't kick it with your spurs, Tom. Or it's going to bite your leg off. Okay, so, but it apparently it was a meat eater. And then, of course, millions of years. Folks, this is what's being taught in schools today. We're having fun with this, but this is what's... Been, for, oh, no, not the Genesis account. This. Okay? Uh, millions of years later uh, came other such horses, such as e uh, Epihippus and Mesohippus and Meohippus and Calobatopus and Parahippus. They always came in twos. Uh, Mary Chip, twos, pair. Hey, you try making this funny, folks. This is a really rough deal. Mary Chip is uh, Flyohippus, Astrohippus, the space horse, uh, and Dinohippus, uh, each changing along its way until finally today we have our current horse called the Equus, okay? And this horse has completely lost all signs of once having multiple toes. How many of you guys actually would like to have a horse that had toes? Put socks on? <laughs> and it seemed to have emerged, that's right, according to evolution, about two million years ago. Okay, and that's, folks, that's, that's, this is some of their major proof for evolution, why we know what's true, okay? But uh, again, if you guys are paying attention to the textbooks, the kids are taught in secular school, you're going to see this stuff still in textbooks today. If you go to museums, this is a major one, the horse evolution on display. This is a major supposed proof for evolution, okay? But the question is, is it even true? Did God get it wrong? Are we being lied to in the Bible? No. And I'll use this word once again, folks. The first reason why we know for sure God is the one who created all the animals. He did it just like that on day six. And Adam literally named them. And it didn't take him millions and millions of years. Is because this horse evolution stuff is a lie. Turn to somebody and let's get warmed up. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Okay? Because we're going to take a look at their supposed proof. And folks, I'm telling you, they've got some serious problems all around the place. Let's take a look at uh, what's really going on with this horse evolution. First of all, there's an existence problem. Okay, the whole thing is made up, folks. The whole idea of horse evolution was made up by this guy, Othniel Marsh in 1879, along with the famous evolutionist Thomas Huxley. They produced a diagram. Again, what do you have for proof? Pictures. Diagram, which attempted to show the slow, gradual change of stages of the horse evolving. Now, the only problem was that Othniel Marsh picked the animals from all over the world. He didn't even find them in one place, and he didn't even find them in that order it was made up. This has been proven alive, folks, a long time ago. They're still using it for proof of evolution. In fact, not only is this supposed order of horse evolution never found in the order it's presented, but there is no place in the world where it can be seen. It simply doesn't exist. It's made up. It's another made-up lie. Okay, then there's the ancient problem. As it turns out, the supposed first ancient horse, we saw there, the Eohippus, it's not even a horse at all. Okay, this is supposed to be the first one, right? Okay, there's a picture of one. It's called the Hyrax, and it's still alive today in South America. Okay, it's the size of a fox, and it's a meat-eating animal with sharp teeth. Oops, that kind of messes it up. And then there's another supposed ancient horse, according to their scale, Hipparion, 
which evolutionists say have been extinct for millions of years. But guess what? I'm still alive today. Uh, Jordan called it out earlier. It's called the Okapi, and it lives in northeastern rainforest of Central Africa. So it's not just still alive. Watch this, folks. In fact, it's not even a horse. It's not even a relative of a horse. It's a relative of a giraffe. The guy literally went around the world, picked a, a bunch of different carcasses, and lined them up and says, well, that, that's the horse. That's how it evolved. They're still alive today, and it has nothing to do with the horse. It's a bunch of baloney. Then there's the genetic problem. Okay, even if you could say that it could happen, and it can't. Uh, if the theory of uh, horse evolution were true, it's got some serious genetic problems to overcome, such as the ribs, the toes, and the teeth. Okay, In all cases, they're totally different, and they're completely inconsistent. Now, again, what's the picture they would have you and I believe? It's a slow, gradual, logical change going for something that's um, primitive to more advanced and better and complex, right? Uh, it's not what at all you find. Okay. For instance, the so-called Eohippus, the ancient horse, had 18 pairs of ribs. The next one, according to their scale, had 15 pairs of ribs. The next one after that went uh, back up to 19 pairs. And the one after that lost another one and went back down to 18 pairs. And it's supposed to get better as you go. It's all messed up. Then there's the number of lumbar vertebrae. Goes from 6 to 8 and then returns to 6 again. What kind of evolution is that? Okay. It's dangerous stuff. You can, uh, folks, you can lose stuff. Okay, according to evolution. Then there's the inconsistency problem, folks. This is crazy. They, they give you an eye the picture like, how dare you question, Bonnie? How dare you even bring this up? We know exactly what we're doing. We're scientists. They don't even agree with each other. Okay, there's over more than 20 charts on the evolution of the horse proposed by various researchers, and they're all completely different from the other. There's no even uh, agreement amongst themselves. Obviously, they haven't reached a common agreement about the theory, and so obviously... Uh, it's not consistent. Now, here's the problem. If the horse evolution were true, you would expect to find also the earliest horse fossils. Remember the one, Eohippus or whatever? You would expect that to be in the lowest rock strata, right? According to them, it should be down here and should only be down there and only up at the top should you find the modern horse. If it's true, right? Well, that's not at all what you find. In fact, the bones of the supposed earliest horses have been found at or near the surface with modern day horses showing us they lived at the same time. It's a bunch of baloney. Uh, in fact, the evolutionists assume that the horse has grown progressively in size over millions of years, right? I said, remember, they, it started out this little teeny tiny fox thing with nah, teeth, nah, two feet tall. Now it's six feet tall. Well, that's not what you find, folks. Uh, and plus, what they forget is, did you know that modern day horses also vary in size? Let me give you a couple examples. The one at the top there is the largest horse called the Clydesdale. While the smallest one down there, it's called the Falabella, it stands only 17 inches tall. I know, isn't it cool? Finally, a horse I could ride. Tom, and if I fall, it's only a couple inches. I'm good to go. Right? That's pretty cool. Actually, I want to get one for my wiener dogs. That'd be kind of... Going... <laughs> Jordan, you get it. All right. Now, the point is, hello, both are members of the same species, but they didn't evolve from each other. Okay? Randy Rounds, please stand up. How tall are you? 6'3", give up for Randy. Woo! Folks, I want you to see right now as proof of evolution, I am apparently two foot four, but as you can tell over millions of years, I, Randy evolved from me. Bonnie, aren't you glad that that's not true? Okay, right, right? Hey, just because something's a different, what? It's crazy, folks, when you put it all together. Now, you got an admission problem. When they put to the test, folks, they even admit it. This is not true. In their own camp, they admit it's a lie. Uh, evolutionist Boyce Rinsberger said, quote, the popular example of horse evolution suggesting a gradual sequence of changes from a four-toed fox-sized creature living nearly 50 million years ago to today's much larger one-toed horse, quote, has long been known to be wrong. It's a lie. They even admit it. Instead of a gradual change, fossils of each intermediate species appear, listen, fully distinct, persist unchanged, and then become extinct. Transitional forms are unknown. So in other words, what do you just say? Uh, the biblical account is true. All you find is these fully formed things. You don't see this transitional stuff going on, no matter how much they want to monkey with the order. Okay, that's exactly what's going on. This guy, Gordon Taylor. Now, again, this is their own camp. Okay, says this, perhaps the most serious weakness of Darwinism is the failure of paleontologists to find convincing sequences of organisms demonstrating major evolutionary change. The horse is often cited as the only fully worked out example. But the fact is that the line from Eohippus to Equus, modern day horse, is very erratic. 
specimens from different sources can be brought together in a convincing looking sequence, but there is what? No evidence that they were actually arranged in this order in time. They just made it up. Okay, paleontologist Colin Patterson, this is the Natural History Museum in London. Listen to what he said. He said there have been an awful lot of what? What's his word? Stories. Okay, some more imaginative than others about what the nature and the history of life really is. The most famous example still on exhibit downstairs, he says, is the exhibit on horse evolution uh, prepared perhaps 50 years ago. That has been presented as the literal truth in textbook after textbook. Now, he says, quote, I think that is lamentable, particularly when the people who propose those kinds of stories may themselves be aware of the speculative nature of some of that stuff. Can I translate that for you? I cannot believe these guys know it's not true, and yet they still continue to put it in the textbook. And they still have it in the museum downstairs. It blows me away. That's what he's saying. This is in their own camp. Okay, in fact, I want to share with this, folks. This is how bad it is. This is how bankrupt. I don't know about you, but when you start to discover what's really going on with this so-called evolution thing and how it's pumped and drilled at you and I, and then when you and I try to bring up some basic biblical facts, we're the ones made to look like we're anti-intellectual. This is so bankrupt, folks. When you put them on the spot, they even will admit. I got a video clip of one of these scientists who admit when he was put on the spot, he was challenged. You see, you don't get, by and large, the ability to challenge him in school. You don't have on the History Channel, and now let's give a rebuttal to the other side of the story. Right? You don't get that. But sometimes when they get interviewed, they get put on the spot. And this guy was asked, even though this was proven a lie over 60 years ago, this one guy was asked to take the thing down. Okay? We'll listen to the response. This horse evolution theory was proven wrong a long time ago. There's a whole variety of horses today, by the way, big ones and little ones. But back in 1950, G.G. Simpson, a famous evolutionist, said, this horse evolution was unintentionally falsified. It's not true. The evolution of the horse was all wrong. It never happened in nature. They've, horse evolution has not held up under close examination. They're never found in the order presented in the textbooks. Tulsa Zoo finally took out their display because a friend of mine wrote him a letter and said, hey, uh, why do you have the horse evolution on display? I've got the letters here somewhere. Did you get those out, Steve? The they're in the suitcase, okay. You can come read those later. He wrote him a letter and said, guys, your horse evolution thing was proven wrong like uh, 50 years ago. You know, would you please remove the display? And they said, we don't have the funding to remove it. <laughs> so he went to a sign shop and got a bid for a sign, 60 bucks or something that says, we'll take this, the sign would say, we will take down this display as soon as we receive the funding because the display is not accurate. He went into the curator at the zoo and said, uh, here's 60 bucks for the sign. This guy will make the sign. When would you like it delivered? He said, what's this? Oh, you're going to take down the, we're going to take down the display when we get the funding. Yeah, he said, you at least warn the people. You know, the display's not right. Well, they didn't take it down. Finally, I forget, 2,000 people signed a petition saying, get this thing out of our zoo. It came on the evening news, 10 o'clock one night. Tulsa Zoo has a false display. Next morning, it was gone. They found the funding. Six months later, they put it back up. Now, why would they do that? Because when you take a look at the so-called proof for evolution, it's all a bunch of lies. And they know, folks, if you and I were to hold them to the fire, like that guy did, that's just one example, this really happens, folks, then they're not going to have any more proof for their theory. Right? But they have to keep these lies in the museums, in the zoos, in the textbooks. Otherwise, everybody will know it's a bunch of baloney. Okay, but based on the facts, we're taking a look at it, folks. How many guys would say that somebody's horsing around with the facts? Hey, you like, hey, hey, you even threw that in for it. I can't throw that far, but up here later, you can get your gum, Jordan. Okay, uh, but anyway, that's all. Uh, the second reason why we know that God created the animals is not only because of this horse evolution, and folks, I'm telling you, this is one of their top ones. The horse evolution, this proves it's true. The second big one that they have out there is the whale evolution, okay? And uh, to show you how big of a whale of a tail it is, Tom, uh, we're going to take a look at, again, let's, we saw the biblical account that God says he's the one that did them all in one day, day six. Let's remind ourselves of how evolution, I'm not making this up, this one's wild. Uh, not that the other one wasn't, but this one's wild. Let's remind ourselves of where supposedly, according to evolution, uh, the whale came from, okay? Starts off with a fairy tale, shocker. And this is their own words, listen to this. Hey, that's right, call it an unfinished story, but with a plot that's a grabber. You feel you sucked into it now? 
Yeah, whatever. Anyway, it's a tale. This is their own word. Tale, story, tale. Is, you might start to see a theme here. They're just making this stuff up. It's a tale of an ancient land mammal making its way back to the sea. Oh. It's, it's like, can you make up your mind? First of all, you say that we supposedly came from the simple cell, which there is no such thing as a simple cell, and then into some fish creature that decided that uh, he wants to go on land, and that's why we have everything today on land. What you're going to see, folks, I'm not making this up. They believe that the whales came from some land animal that decided to go back into the sea and evolve into a whale. Make up your mind. Okay, I'm not making this up, folks. And they believe that some land animal became the forerunner of today's whales about 50 million years ago. Okay, and his first ancestors learned to swim. So here's the deal. You guys, do you think it's funny having these pools here in Vegas? It's dangerous. The more you swim, you could turn into something. Because that was the impetus, apparently, for what? We're going to see a bear to turn into a whale. <laughs> oh, yeah. First of all, they said, you see, whales evolved from warm-blooded, air-breathing, mammalian ancestors that once lived on land. And you can see that picture there. Now, let's be honest, folks. If that thing came crawling up out of you from a lake, how many guys would shoot it with a shotgun in three seconds? Bang. How many guys would say dead creatures have no babies? Okay, but anyway, but that's supposedly some caricature of an early whale. Okay, if you can believe that. But in doing so, it lost its leg. Oh, I'm t this stuff is dangerous. You lose your toes, you lose your legs. It's just, oh man, this stuff. Anyway, then all of its vital systems became adapted, they say, to a marine existence, probably in search for food. Now, think about this logically. This is supposed to be the impetus as to why you changed into a whale, because you were in search for food. And again, I thought, uh, that's why I'm showing this picture. All right, if that's true, uh, you guys better be careful to drive through. You do it enough, you're going to turn into a whale, right? Because you're, you're in search of food, and we all know that's the impetus for evolution. Okay, let's move on. Hey, this is in textbooks, folks. We're laughing at it, but this is what kids are being brainwashed with today. But they've got names for them. That's right, all the different stages, apparently. There's Pachycetus, and Ambulocetus, and Rhodocetus, and Procetus, and Cuchicetus, and Duodon, and Basilosaurus, and uh, uh, whatever Cetus, and Squalodon, and uh, Cetotherium, and, and finally Kindredon. In fact, the evolution of the whale from a land mammal was actually the reverse of what happened millions of years ago. Uh, yeah, how about make up your mind? When the first sea creature crawled out of the sea and onto land. All right, that is kind of funny. But how many guys, it's a nervous laughter because you know a relative that looks like that and you don't want to raise your hand. Yeah. Okay, yeah, all right, I know what's out there. Let's move on. Now, they, now this is their own words. Listen to this. Do you talk about an oxymoron? Okay, now, some details remain, listen, fuzzy and under investigation. But we know for certain... <laughs> Can you believe that? But we know for certain that this back to the water evolution did occur. Really? Or are you there? Okay. And uh, is it even holding up to the proof? And it's not. Okay. But again, folks, how many guys, if you remember in school, okay, or on TV or whatever, have heard about whale evolution? Okay. Uh, a little bit, a few of us, okay. But the point is, once again, let's deal with the facts. Are we just going to disagree as Christians because that disagrees with the Bible? No. Let's, let's. You know, God is trustworthy. We don't need to doubt him. But let's do our homework. Let's take a look at the facts and see if this horse evolution or whale evolution uh, is true. Okay. And folks, just like with the horse uh, evolution, this is a bunch of baloney. Okay. And uh, let's take a look at the, the facts. Okay. In 1859, Darwin actually suggested, I'm not making this up, that whales arose from bears. Yep. And he sketched a scenario in which selective pressures might have caused bears to evolve into whales. Because we all know, you draw a picture of it, it's got to be true. Okay, yeah. But embarrassed, true story, by the criticism, he removed his hypothetical swimming bears from the later editions of The Origin of Species. Okay, because he made fun of them. Then, early in the 20th century, this guy, Elber Hard Frost and Charles Andrews, suggested that primitive carnivores uh, were the ancestors of whales. So they came from cats. Right? Cats. Yeah. How many guys like cats? All two of you, praise God. You're sitting over there. Uh, let's move on. Uh, then later, this guy picked up on it, W.D. Matthew of the American Museum of Natural History. And he says, no, no, no. Whales descended from rat-like creatures. Okay? But this idea never gained much support. And I can see why. Because especially if you've got a basement, you know, sometimes you can get rats down there. You know, if you let it go on too long, you don't call that guy. Next thing you know, you're going to have a whales all over the place. It's going to be hard to do laundry, Tom. They're going to hog up the room. And I just hate it when that happens. You know, just ruin a good basement. 
Uh, but anyway, this guy, then, uh, next guy, Everhard Johann Slibscher, whatever, tried to combine the two ideas, right? Okay. And he said that whales descended from carnivorous rat-like creatures. So now they're going to bite you when you go down there to do your laundry. So be careful. It's dangerous. Uh, and then, I'm not making this up, this is in textbooks today, being taught even on television, that's right, to little crumb snatchers and adults. The current version is that whales evolved from a wolf-like creature, if you can believe this. The point is, obviously, the versions are not only pretty uh, different from each other, they don't agree, once again, but they're pretty wild, okay? But let's take a look at the evidence, okay? First of all, I don't think so. You can make up a story all you want, but you've got a major design problem. Okay, whales and dolphins have many unique features designed to enable them to live in water. Let me give you a few of those, okay? For example, they have uh, enormous lung capacity for long dives. They got a powerful tail with a large horizontal fluke, and it's for strong swimming. Uh, they have eyes designed to see in water and are able to withstand high pressures. And that's important because how many guys hate it when your eyeballs blow up? Me personally, especially when you're driving. Oh, Okay, but anyway, uh, they, they have ears designed differently from land mammals with eardrums protected just like the eyeballs from the high pressure. Uh, they have sweat glands that incorporate fibrous fatty blubber and fins and tongues that have countercurrent heat exchangers to minimize heat loss because it gets cold down there. Uh, in fact, they even have nostrils on top of their head uh, of what's called blowholes, okay? So that's where their nose is on top of their head. They have specially fitted mouths and nipples so babies can be breastfed underwater, as well as filtering mechanisms for food intake. In fact, they even have a sonar system so precise it can detect a fish the size of a golf ball 230 feet away. That's a pretty complex system that they got, okay, is what's going on. Now, let's put this thing to the test. Go ahead and scratch your head if you like. Uh, wait a second. How in the world could a creature slowly change from a land animal with none of those characteristics to an aquatic one with all those characteristics? I don't think so, folks, but let's put it to the test. Somehow, it would have to, first of all, lose its shaggy hair and its backbone flexibility and little tail. Okay, just when you wake up one day and says, well, I just want to get rid of that stuff. Okay, then, okay, on top of that, your nostrils would have to move from the end of the snout to the top of the head. Now, my wiener dogs, they love sticking their head out the window. But I don't care how fast I drive, their uh, nose is never going on top of their head. You know what I'm saying? I could try. Evolution, come on. That's 100. It, what? How does your nose get to the top of your head? That's just the nose, folks. We're just getting started when you do a comparison. Then the front legs would have to change the flippers somehow. I, maybe a truck ran over it, got the process started. I don't know. What are you going to do? Uh, then the back legs would have to disappear. You just get rid of them. I don't need them anymore. Uh, and the external ears would have to become internal ears. Okay, you know, something on Saturday because it gets boring, you know. Uh, and then their breathing, hearing, and birthing capabilities would have to change from a land-based existence uh, to an aquatic, aquatic one, underwater. How do you do that? How many guys have ever tried to breathe underwater and it just didn't work out too well? Right? And usually the choking and the gasping kind of gives it away. How, do, how does that evolve? Right? The first time you try, uh, you're not having a family because you're not around anymore. Okay, excuse me. And that's just one little aspect there. And furthermore, that's right, open up a can of duh. Uh, uh, all of these features have to be fully functional and fully present if you're going to survive, right? You can't say, oh, you, what, if the, what if somehow over a weekend, miraculously, but again, they don't believe in miracles, but miraculously, you could evolve half of those features of a dolphin or a whale. But you haven't got the other half yet. You're still dead. All those features have to be there fully functioning all at the same time you're dead meat. Then there's the vestigial problem. Now, this is where they snooker people even in school today. And they still show pictures of this. It's a lie. They know it's a lie, but this is their only proof. One of the major proofs, they say, oh, no, 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 no. We know that whales evolved from land-walking mammals. And they say, there's a picture one there, they have supposed vestigial bones, i.e. they don't need them no more. They say those were once the remnant of legs. Right? Those little bones, they're little tiny bones back there, Okay. Now, and here's some actual photographs. This textbook here says that a whale has a vestigial pelvis and it's the evidence of its evolutionary history, okay? And this is a kid's uh, ch uh, children's book, says, listen to this, that's right, folks. Just imagine whales walking around, it's true. If you sniff too much glue in that bottle, which you're not supposed to do, that's dangerous, right? That's the only way you're gonna imagine this, what? Well, they just imagine it's true that whales walking around Woo yeah as it turns out folks those bones they're not vestigial they need them 
okay? And neither are they the remains of ancient legs, okay? It's now known that they are necessary bones that act as the anchor for the muscles of the genitalia, and without them, the whales cannot reproduce. That's, they have a function. As it turns out, those bones have nothing to do with walking on land. They have to do with getting more baby whales. Okay, that's what it is. I, one guy actually said, he says, now listen, I'll give the people credit. Either they're ignorant of whale anatomy, which means you shouldn't be teaching it in school them, or two, you're lying on purpose. That's your only options, folks. It's a bunch of baloney, okay? Then there's the picture problem. Okay, remember, there's pictures. That's their, that's their proof. Okay, get, listen to this. The top of a uh, skeletal structure is the pachycetus. You know, again, remember all the stages are supposed to go through, and they put them in this order, and therefore it must be true. Well, one of them, as we saw earlier, was pachycetus. This is actually published in Nature magazine. I want to show you how much they lie. The reconstruction below is pachycetus by Carl Buell, artist guy, and it's based on the structure above, what they found, the bones, and it looks pretty accurate, right? Standing on legs, walking on land, right? Watch this. However, National Geographic portrayed pachycetus as the one below in a swimming position. That's not what the bones showed. Notice it has fins, hind legs stretching out backwards as if it's swimming. The problem is none of it's true. Not even based on the bones that you found. The bones still don't prove it, but you doctored the photos. Then at the top, we have another example, Ambulocetus. However, you can see, take a look, it's obviously clearly walking on land, it's a land animal, but National Geographic portrayed below shows the animal with rear legs, not with feet that would help it to walk, but with fins that would assist it to swim. Again, none of it's true. It's all make-believe propaganda made up in the textbooks. In fact, uh, it is now known that the true leg bones of Ambulocetus possess the ability to move powerfully on land, and they're real legs, and they're not fins at all. They know that, folks, okay? In fact, they even admit it, just like with the horse evolution. Evolutionist Robert Carroll said, it is not possible to identify a sequence of land animals leading directly to whales. So why do you keep putting in the textbooks? Because that's all they got. I'm telling you, folks, this is how bankrupt it is. And as I stated before, this is what gets me when Christians get snookered into somehow going, I guess somehow we've got to squeeze evolution into the Bible. This is so bankrupt, it's ridiculous, folks. Why would we ever even think about doing that? Evolutionist whale expert, this guy, uh, says that he does not support the description of Pachycetus, Ambulocetus, and similar four-legged creatures as possible ancestors of the whale. Instead, he says they belong to a completely isolated group. In other words, they have nothing to do with whales. And this is in their own camp, folks. And finally, another whale expert uh, said this, evolutionary expert, quote, said this, we do not possess a single fossil of transitional forms between land animals and whales. So why do you keep propagating this? The, I mean, again, you might think I'm blowing it out of proportion, okay, but I'm not. This is their best evolution. It's bankrupt. You get rid of this, you hold their feet to the fire, they have nothing to print in the textbook. It's that bankrupt, folks. Okay, in fact, when they're put on the spot, they actually admit it. Watch this guy, he's going to be put on the spot, an evolutionist. And he admits, well, okay, yeah, I made it up. This is wild. Check this out. When this video series was being filmed on location at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, the executive producer noticed a discrepancy between museum drawings of Rhodocetus and the fossils. The reconstruction of Rhodocetus had a whale fluke, but there were no fossils of the tail to confirm this. Dr. Phil Gingrich, the scientist responsible for the discovery and reconstruction of Rhodocetus, was questioned how he knew there was a whale fluke on Rhodocetus, since that part of the fossil was missing. What was the uh, reasoning that uh, the scientists think there was a fluke on Rhodocetus? Um, based on the other pieces of anatomy? Well, I told you we don't have the tail in Rhodocetus, so we don't know for sure whether we'd had a ball vertebra indicating a fluke or not. So I speculated it might have had a fluke. Okay, so what did he just say? There's no evidence for it. I made it up. Got him on tape. You notice he almost seemed a little nervous giving that answer there? I'm telling you folks, they are not used to, it's a closed system. You don't get the right to challenge them. But when they are challenged, it's like, oh, oh, oh. you find out just how bankrupt uh, it really is, okay? But again, as you take a look at the facts, somebody is making a whale of a tail, okay? And uh, based on this, uh, again, I think the premise is pretty accurate, Tom. Hey, if all you got is lies to support your theory, maybe it's time to get a new theory. 
<laughs> hey, what a concept, okay? And whether you realize or not, I want to close with this analogy, okay? Uh, all these supposed photos, all these make-believe uh, displays, they're about as dangerous to people, not just physically, but as we're going to see spiritually, as this photo manipulation is uh, to young women. Let's take a look. Our perception of beauty is distorted. It's not even real. Now follow this. When I came across I go, ooh, that's the perfect analogy. How many girls do we know, unfortunately, who get suckered into this? And it's all photo manipulation. You can't live up to that. It's impossible because it's not real. And they starve themselves, they kill themselves to live up to a fake image. How many people are being led astray? Their perception of God is distorted. Because evolution, their so-called proof, is just as distorted. Made up doctored photos that make Photoshop look like chump chain. How many people are, are being led away from him by the same manipulation? Isn't that wild? Hey, but you might be thinking, tell me, well, okay, all right, so maybe this uh, ape man evolution is a bunch of baloney. Maybe this animal evolution is a bunch of baloney. Uh, horse and whale, certainly. Uh, but wait a second, what about all those mechanisms? They say, oh, no, 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 we know that evolution happens. You know, like natural selection, we saw vestigial organs, what about mutations? Well, folks, you want to be here, Lord willing, next week, uh, because we're going to take a look at the lie of natural selection. And you're also going to see that, Lord willing, uh, that when we get into that, it's not just a lie, it's dangerous. Did you know that it was natural selection that Hitler used as the justification to slaughter the Jewish people? Because they weren't the strongest, the fittest. His people were. They were the lowest on his evolutionary chain. We'll look at that, Lord willing, next time. Let's pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries. And I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief, okay? The Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not use the Lord's name 
in vain. Hey folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word? Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy. Okay, and folks, let's be honest, we've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pull the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that and it's just as bad. He knows the mind. He knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God, and you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn, we, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it, and a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail, and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a of death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it, if he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him 
to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that right now? Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and, and Get a Life Ministries. And if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to contact us. Uh, our number, our information will uh, come up here on the screen shortly. And uh, uh, if there's anything we could do for you, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.